After the initial excitement of joining up and training, the Otagos now found themselves on a long sea voyage, unsure of their final destination. So how did this come about? Defence Minister James Allen had been in Britain in 1913 where he proposed a, an empire expeditionary force to which New Zealand would contribute and, and that expeditionary force would be sent to wherever it may have been needed in the world. Being stuck on a troop ship for the best part of two months can't have been much fun. How did the soldiers feel on board? It was a strange mixture of, of excitement and apprehension in about equal measure. Uh, so, you know, and uh, the, other, the thing that tempered both of those uh, emotions, I guess, was boredom. Uh, what to do when you're on know, this long sea voyage, uh, other than crossing the line in a few moments like that and a bit of fun. The rest of the time was you know, pretty tedious. Initially there was lots of excitement. I guess the apprehension would have gone up and the excitement gone down as, as, as the war wore on. Definitely there was, there was fear of both attack from either above or below, as it were. So that added uh, to the fear. As, as the war went on, the convoy system got better. I guess that, ref that fear reduced a bit. But up until, I don't know, mid-1917, that would have been a real fear. So, the Tigers eventually disembarked in Egypt. But why did they end up there when the war was being fought in France and Belgium? In 1914, the experience of Canadian troops in England under training. And the winter in England was so harsh in 1914 that the health of the Canadians suffered terribly. So when the Australian and New Zealand convoy was heading up through the um, Indian Ocean, up through the Suez Canal, they were destined to land in e again in England and go into training there. But the decision was made that the troops would, would instead be diverted to Egypt which was then under British protectorate, and that they could be trained there and hardened up in the Egyptian sun. And then when the campaign season opened up again in um, France in, in March, that they'd be shipped off to France and start fighting on the Western Front. And so Egypt it was. But was there any sort of war to be fought there? There was some threat of attack through the Sinai Peninsula down across the Suez Canal that was not really expected, that the Turks would amass a huge force and try and knock Egypt out of the war. So, in fact, was it February 1915, New Zealanders first went into combat on the Suez Canal. The prospect, not, not, the, not the actuality, but the prospect of an attack on the Suez Canal, and so the British government thought, well, all these New Zealanders and Australians have got to you know, they're on their way to, to us, so we'll divert them to, uh, to Egypt where they can protect the canal, and, and that's what they did. So the idea was, land them in Egypt, train them, harden them in Egypt, and then send them off to France. But it didn't quite work out that way. Egypt was quite unlike anything the troops from New Zealand had experienced before. It was a real culture shock and a total assault on their senses. Now I think they embraced it. I mean, they, they were, again, young men halfway around the world and they're exposed to all the, the history and the vice that um, the Middle East could offer. Fred Waite was quite honest about it, that there was something for everybody, really. There was tourism, you could climb up the Great Pyramids and have a look at the Sphinx, carve your name alongside that of Napoleon's troops from 100 years earlier. You could try the food, you could see the sights, and, of course, then the um, Harat al Waza the red light area had all the temptations of the flesh that a young man could possibly try. And as Fred, Fred Waite himself was writing in 1919, why wouldn't they? They were about to head off to war. So um, I think it's fair to say that the Australians, Kiwis, probably had a really good time in Egypt. That's aside from the training, when they're out on route marches under the blazing sun to be hardened up. Now that wasn't quite as much fun. And I did notice that the, the farriers who went over with the Otago mounted rifles, they had to start working at night because it was too hot in the blazing desert sun to shoe the horses and run the furnaces. 
The locals were reasonably friendly, cosmopolitan city, and I'm not sure that they bought into the old Ottoman Empire's idea of a jihad, which was proclaimed in October of 1914. So um, it, was, it was probably as good a place as any to have a base. The train in Egypt was hot, tedious and hard, hard work. But was it of any use to the New Zealand soldiers? Well, according to Chris Puxley, the New Zealand uh, soldiers were much better trained than either the Australian or the Canadian equivalents, but that didn't mean that they were anywhere near prepared for the horrors that they were going to go into. Uh, they had an awful lot to learn on the ground and that we made a lot of mistakes at Gallipoli along with the Aussies for, for that very reason. We were good shots. Uh, and we knew how to do drill, uh, but that's not necessarily so important when you're under pressure of, of fire. And the training in the desert was useful enough that it showed them how to work in units and particularly how to pass mess messages along, which became vital on Gallipoli. So in terms of then attacking up a hill, well, Egypt's flat, so that's not particularly helpful training ground for a, an assault on a rocky, pen rocky peninsula which is cut by ravines. As the casualties at Gallipoli mounted, the need for reinforcements meant that the Otago Mounted Rifles, who had been left behind in Egypt, would now have to serve there, but as infantry, leaving their horses behind. How did they react to this news? Very badly. Um, this is a wonderful piece in, in Guy Powell's uh, history of, of the mounted regiments in Sinai and Palestine, where he talks about a man's relationship with his horse, and it was, it was a very intense kind of relationship. A horse was very important to these men, and of course, we had won most of our fine reputation in the Boer War because of our skill as horsemen, which included the ability to look after a horse. And, and so they weren't very, in fact, they were, they were devastated, probably is the best way to put it. Obviously, they trained and trained and trained as a mounted unit, and their role was as a scouting unit for the infantry. They were always supposed to go on ahead, but Gallipoli never worked out that way. The infantry went in first, the mounteds came in as reinforcements. So they had to go into battle, and I think Bockett, the, the colonel in charge of the Otago Mountains, did accept that their change in role, for which they had been training, was, was the best in the circumstances. And once they got to Gallipoli, they certainly got into the fighting. But in preference, they were a mounted unit through and through, and that's how they always wanted to serve. After their four months training in Egypt, the Otagos learnt that they were to take part in an invasion of the Gallipoli Peninsula in an attempt to knock Germany's ally, Turkey, out of the war. The gamble of Gallipoli wasn't just knocking Turkey out of the war. It wasn't just opening up the straits and trying to get a new supply line through to the Russians and bolster their war effort. That was part of it. But the bigger picture was trying to get other nations such as Greece and Bulgaria on the Allied side because they were, they were neutral and no way to see which way the wind blew before they threw their hat in the ring. In 1915, if Greece and Bulgaria had come on the, and on the Allied side, that would have effectively sealed off the Austrians and the Germans. So the Central Powers would have been surrounded. That gamble may have been worth it. So the, the bigger picture in terms of the Middle East, the Ottoman Empire's significance there, it was more than just landing thousands of troops on a beachhead to try and secure a naval passage. The Gallipoli Peninsula was only a few hundred miles from the capital of the Ottoman Empire, Constantinople, now known as Istanbul. So here we are in Istanbul looking out over the Bosphorus. Imagine this scene filled with British warships. That was the idea of the Gallipoli campaign, to force the Narrows and let the Royal Navy come through here and leave the Turks quaking in their boots. They thought they would crumble at the sight of all those warships, that Turkey would be out of the war, Germany would be weakened, and a great blow would have been struck. I don't think it ever would have happened. Even if they had come through, we saw how fiercely the Turks were prepared to defend every last inch of soil on Gallipoli. How much more would they have tried to defend their capital? So now it was time to see how this grand scheme, cooked up by English politicians, would actually unfold on the ground. The myth is that everybody landed at dawn. Now that was the reality for the Australians, of course. 
but the New Zealanders didn't start landing till the mid-morning on the 25th of April and the Otagos don't get there till after two in the afternoon, by which time the fighting's well underway. Fred Rogers, later our company sergeant major, recalled getting up to, across the beach and seeing the cliffs and the Australians coming down holding their knees and what have you, the wounded coming down and saying, get up there mate, that's where the fight is, that's where you need it. And by then, a lot of the infrastructure of Gallipoli was already coming into play. The troops were being landed, the stores were being landed, so the battle was, was well, in, well in place. And in fact, by the time the Otagos arrived, the front lines, as they were for the next month or so, were already determined. The Australians had gotten as far as inland as they could. The Anzac front line had been more or less established by the time the Otago infantry arrived at Gallipoli on the afternoon of the 25th of April. The opening days of the campaign proved the logistical debacle. Right from the beginning, things went awry here at Gallipoli. They were supposed to land further south on Brighton Beach, a long, flatter stretch of beach with a good inland area for assembly and all those sorts of uh, things that armies really need to set up a big attack like what's going on here. But anyway, the Australians landing pre-dawn, they didn't know. Once they got to the beach, they just knew they had to go up those hills and so they went. Heroically climbing up the cliffs and the hills, being shot at by a small group of Turkish defenders who held them up long enough and caused enough confusion that everything was in disarray here in the beach. Units all mixed up. Just a total mess, really. The Targos didn't land until the afternoon. First group ashore with the 8th Southland Company at 2.30pm, followed by the Dunedin Company, then the North Otagos and finally the South Otago Company, all ashore by 4pm. Targo ready to go. First of all, they were sent off to the left, extreme left of the position, and they were recalled and sent up Pluggy's Plateau, Steep Hill, which was the site of the major struggles on the first day or two of the beach landings. So this is where it all began, 25th of April, 1915. The Otago's first taste of battle is being shot at by Australians. Because these were fresh troops coming in in different uniforms, and the poor Australians thought they were Turks coming in from, up, from another angle. Okay, so just imagine, here we are, we've landed on the beach. I've got a backpack on, it's got a few notes and a few things, a bottle of water in it, but it doesn't weigh much. Imagine those young guys with their rifle, all the uh, rounds of ammunition they had to carry, the iron rations, the entrenching tool, the bayonet, heaps of weight in that. They had to run up these steep cliffs. Now the cliffs aren't there anymore, there's a new road been put in there and it's all been paired away. But I'm going to run up this culvert, which is right in the centre of the beach at Anzac Cove, and which shows you some of the steepness. I'm going to run. OK. And that was only the start. There was a further steep climb up to Pluggy's Plateau. So now I'm standing on the road that's been cut into the cliffside uh, relatively recently, but you can see the steep hills behind me and get an idea of how rugged this countryside is and how hard it was for the troops landing on the 25th to claw their way up, pulling at bushes and being shot at as they did it. And up the top there, the ridge line you can see is Pluggy's Plateau where the Otago boys were deployed for the first couple of days at Gallipoli and where they took their first significant casualties. This uh, lookout point from Russell's top gives us a great view down to the landing beaches. On my right you can see the very distinctive shape of the Sphinx. Down the bottom you can see the Anzac Memorial area. This is just northward of Anzac Cove. In behind the Sphinx on the other side was a valley called Reserve Gully. The Otago spent a bit of time there when they were in reserve, as the name suggests. The valley in between the Sphinx and the next ridge over, which is Walker's Ridge, is called Mule Gully. It was pretty safe. The Turks couldn't really shoot down there, so that was the route up for lots of supplies on the mules. Walker's Ridge, on the other hand, look how steep that is. This was the site of an ascent on the first day, and they took the advanced trenches over where the cemetery is to the right, Walker's Ridge Cemetery. Quite a few Otago men buried in there. So that's Walker's Ridge, taken on the first day, and you can see how steep it was. Quite an amazing achievement.
The Otago Infantry Regiment landed at Gallipoli with 912 soldiers and 25 officers. The first four days, that landing phase of the campaign, they lost 18 of those men killed and 60 of them wounded. Relatively light casualties, I suppose, in the long term, but every one of those boys had a mother, a family who had mourned them. And here in the cemetery at the north end of the beach, there's one at the south end as well, we found just one named Otago Regiment soldier, W.A. Darnell. Behind him there's a row of New Zealand mounted men killed at later phase of the landing, but this one, Darnell died on the 27th of April 1915, aged 33, which makes him a little bit older than the average uh, age of the Otago troops who landed here. The Otago's quickly adapted to the new landscape around North Beach that was to be their home for the next nine months. Uh, northwards of here was very significant for the uh, New Zealanders, including the Otago Mounted Rifles and Otago Infantry Battalion. Most of their activity was in these areas and northwards. Uh, looking up to the green curve of the hill up there, we're looking at the back of Pluggies Plateau, and that exposed cliff face up there is where Quinn's Post and Courtney's Post were, right on the brow of the hill, panning around across through what's now covered in bush, which was pretty much stripped back to the bare clay back in 1915. We have this very striking feature, which the soldiers back in 1915 called the Sphinx. It reminded them of the Sphinx that they'd seen for real in Egypt not long before. And that gives you a good idea of the exposed nature of the area in which the New Zealanders and Australians had to dig themselves in, taking shelter uh, in little dugouts they made in the cliff faces and then building lots of sandbagged support areas all around this area. Let me see, were there big opportunities lost on those opening days? Probably the biggest opportunity was the chance to pull everybody off at the end of the first day when it was clear that the attack had not achieved its objectives. So I don't really know what else could have happened on those days. We are landed at the wrong place, essentially. We are given terrible terrain to move over quickly. We are given a height to capture which, well, quite honestly, it's, it's, it's too much for the small, the small force involved to capture. And then, once you've captured that height, you're supposed to cut right across the peninsula and knock the Turks out of the war. I mean, the Turks were never going to let that happen. And so, nearly 10 months after many of them had first joined up, the Otagos finally found themselves in a fight on the Gallipoli Peninsula. For them, the landing had been relatively easy. But there would be no such ease in the long months ahead. 